who is the first external speaker of the seminar series this semester. So, Anna is an economist, um, graduate from UPenn 2019, okay? And uh, she is at Barcelona, but currently visiting Penn again. Uh, and she's a liberal economist. She works on search on labor market institutions. She has a lot of interesting work on the role of family leave policies. Even the paper today, I think, is very timely and very important. Don't get job search and mobility over the life cycle and significations uh, for the child penalty. So I'm going to turn it over to Hannah. Looking forward to this. So uh, Hannah has agreed to take questions during the seminar. So we'll go till, till one. We have to stop by one. Uh, and feel free to ask questions during the seminar. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much for the introduction. Um, yeah, very happy to be here. So this is joint work with uh, Minji, who just moved to Cambridge now, um, who's a great economist too. And yeah, um, as as he was saying, I'm visiting um, Penn this year. So um, yeah, so this paper is um, trying to study um, women's search over the life cycle. And um, as an introduction, um, probably you're all familiar with this phenomenon of the so-called child penalty. Um, so this uh, tends to describe the fact that women's earnings um, go down drastically after having the first child. Um, and also it tends to affect wage growth in the long run as well. And the main explanation for this usually is um, uh, the decrease in women's labor supply following having children, that they work less, and so they earn less money, and um, that also negatively affects human capital accumulation. Um, but so here we want to study a new aspect that might also contribute um, to this child penalty. So we want to look at job search and job switching. So, um, you know, searching for new jobs and changing to new jobs might be really important because they can help you get into jobs that offer both better wages and maybe better working conditions. So if it's the case that having children somehow interferes with your ability to look for these new jobs and go, um, go to new jobs, then that might also have some impact on your career. So here, um, yeah, we're going to look at this and how, you know, this search channel is going to affect um, earnings and wages over the life. Um, so why could it be the case that um, your ability to search for these new jobs could be influenced um, by, you know, you having your child? Um, on the one hand, you know, um, it might simply be that you just don't have as much time or as much energy to be doing this job search when you're either, you know, pregnant or you have children, um, especially maybe smaller children, that require a lot of attention. Okay? So this, I think, is really pretty clear. Um, then also, also, you know, maybe um, you're going to get worse offers because of discrimination against um, either pregnant women or, again, um, mothers. Um, so maybe an employer would know about your family status and might give you um, a worse offer or not make you an offer at all. And then lastly, there might actually be some explicit returns to job tenure. Um, so this depends on the institutional context. But for instance, in the context we're studying, which is the Netherlands, um, there's actually a law that says that um, you might only be eligible for some benefits if you've been at the job for a certain amount of time. Um, so for instance, for unpaid parental leave, actually you're only eligible if you've already been at the employer for a year. Okay, so these can also be an incentive why uh, mothers are sort of not switching jobs. Okay, so um, at the same time, there's been a recent literature that shows that other aspects of work are important for uh, mothers uh, or maybe should be mothers. Um, these are so-called child-friendly amenities. So there's sort of different uh, aspects of that. Um, this paper is of, by Lebao Shaw and co-authors looks at commuting. Um, Claudia Golden has emphasized more flexibility. Um, so we're, all gonna, we're also going to study a set of these amenities that we can observe in our data. And so we're focusing sort of more on the work schedule. So we're going to look at overtime work and also irregular work hours. 
Um, and we can see how, you know, how these men and these um, change women around birth and how that is linked to them switching to different jobs. Okay, so what do we do exactly? So here we use this nice Dutch data, which uh, has both an um, administrative component, and we also have um, some large surveys that we can link to the admin data. And so using that, we first you know, document some patterns for job search, job switching, and also these different amenities around the timing of first birth. Then we develop a model uh, for discrete choice, um, where women choose whether they want to search um, for a new job, whether they want to uh, change to a new job, and how many hours they want to work. And with this model, then we can decompose how much of the child penalty can be attributed to this new channel of, um, of search and switching, um, as you know, opposed to the old, uh, more, uh, yeah, more well-known channel of um, working less. And then we connect um, kind of uh, you know, this finding to some policy. So um, how, you know, does the implication of childcare subsidies change depending if we take into account this search channel or not? And also we um, are looking at a reform that happened just sort of recently in the Netherlands in 2015, where they actually eliminated this tenure requirement. So in order to be eligible for a parental leave, they no longer had to be working at the same employer for a year. Um, so this is also something we're studying. But you might also think even before they have had the child, in anticipation of this child now, they will sort it to certain kinds of jobs. Yeah. So are you going to take that into account? Or? Yes. That's going to be there. Uh, yeah. So yeah. you'll you'll tell me if you okay. think that's the way it's popping up. It makes sense or. Okay. Um. So just some words about the literature. Uh, so yeah, there is sort of a lot of work on the child penalty in general. Also, uh, some you know quite a few papers looking at it in the life cycle framework. And then of course there's also many search um, models that feature some endogenous search effort, which is also something we're doing. So we're kind of combining these two different frameworks, um, both having this um, search decision, but also in the life cycle framework, which we think is important, especially when studying women's behavior, since the life cycle structure is so. Um, yeah, it's so salient and uh, we really want to model in detail, you know, the different ages at which women do kind of different things. Um, that also relates to this work on amenities. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so the nice thing is that we do have these very nice micro data on both um, these, on the job uh, search decisions and also um, work amenities, which is not very common to have, um, especially since job searches tends to be more observed for unemployed people and it's very difficult to get data on for um, employed people. Okay, so just gonna jump to the data patterns that we have. Um, so yeah, so just uh, to explain again a bit, so right now our main data is from 2006, 2020 um, from the admin data source of so these employment records and we also have um, the registry data which allows us to on the one hand, see um, where the universe of the Dutch population is employed, how many hours they work, how, uh, what's their wage, you know, do they switch from firm to firm? And then we can merge this with all of the individual characteristics, um, age, education, uh, nationality. And then we can also see the household structure. So who is married to whom? Um, are they married cohabiting? Um, so we're gonna group these two together into sort of being married. And then also we can see when the kids are born. Then in addition, we um, can link these admin records to these large scale surveys. So these are cross-sectional surveys, but they're quite large. Um, and they, they actually offer the same information. So we can see both um, on the job and off the job search. And also um, we can, you have these, uh, some questions on job amenities, which we're going to use to um, create an amenity measure. Okay, so this is just to motivate why switching to a new job might be important. Um, so this is simply um, you know, showing an event study but not really controlling for anything. Um, this is uh, centered at the timing of the job-to-job -job transition. Okay, so um, we can see that for hourly wages, there's a gradual increase, but there's really a decreased jump when people make this job-to-job um, -job transition. And so the sample here is actually our women's sample only. So we can see that you know making this job job transition can really be a big boost for your wage. And if you do kind of a rough calculation of how big that increase is, it's something like four percent of the hourly wage. These are like direct job to job transitions, not yeah. like losing a job. 
Yeah, so here actually, I think we only focus on uh, yeah, being employed in one job in one month, and the next month you're already at a new job. So it's only for men in our system. It's bigger for men, the, the increase in rates. Okay, and uh, now we have some uh, graphs for the job to job transitions and also the job search. So here uh, we have men as well for reference. And this is now centered at the timing of first birth. Um, so women are in red, men are in blue, and this is the frequency of uh, the job-to-job -job transition. Okay, so we can see that uh, men and women sort of switch similarly two, uh, two years before having the first child. The rates are quite similar, but then for women, there's really this uh, stark drop, especially when they're pregnant and maybe a couple of months after having a kid. But even you know, many years after, when the child's already five to six years old, there's still a much lower uh, rate of stop to job switching for women compared to men. Uh, yeah. This is for men who also just had a ch child or just men in general? No, this is for men that also had a child. So this is exactly the same graph as women. That's great. Um, no, it's just interesting that it seems like um, even before pregnancy starts, that women are already starting to Yes, right. So this goes back to what its point that exactly it looks like um, in agitation there's already something going on. Um, but I think, yeah, especially it's like around the time of pregnancy or maybe where they intend to become pregnant, it's where you see most of the action. Yeah, there seems to be this curious spike around the birth date for 12 months, 24 months, 36 months. Right. There's a spike. Any idea what that's about? Yes, so I think it's, it's to do with seasonality, so we actually want to look into that more. Um, I think a lot of births are happening in the fall. Somehow for men, this is creating quite a bit of seasonality. But yeah, it's true that it's, uh, it's quite prominent, so we're going to look into that a bit more. So here, this is using the um, sort of high frequency of admin data um, that we can see these job switching patterns. Um, but we can also look at job search, which is reported in those day before surveys. That's just going to be at the yearly level. Um, and here we do the same graph, and we can see it's sort of a similar drop for women here as well. Um, and again, like many years after, we still have lower job search rates um, for women. And this is only looking at on the job search. Yeah. So it is, it is simply just a bare, uh, it's just a question they answer, um, just if you're currently employed, are you looking for another employer? So it's simple yes, no. No. No, unfortunately, we, we don't have sort of an intensity, but um, yeah. I think for the unemployed, we actually have more details. Um, yeah. Yeah, so here we're conditioning on people who are employed. Um, so there would be a selection going on as women drop out. Um, there's roughly something like um, almost 10% of women drop out. Um, I can show you quickly. No, 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 that's fine. Okay, so yeah, so in the, in the Netherlands, the dropout is really not that high it's compared to other countries. Um, so it is a bit less of a concern, but there's roughly like 10% of women dropping out. Okay, and now here are similar graphs now for amenities. Um, so we, um, we have uh, you know, these specific measures in our data, which are more about kind of the scheduling of work hours, how the hours are distributed almost like during the day. Um, so we have, on the one hand, these overtime working hours, um, and then we have working at night, working in the evening, working uh, on the weekends, Saturday and Sunday, and then doing shift work. And so here, um, the, uh, y, the Y variable is the frequency variable, so um, they just reply what they have to do this never, sometimes, or regularly. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a, sometimes maybe not perfect, because again, it's not an hourly measure, but you know, uh, even just doing this, we can still see, um, you know, kind of similar pattern where there's quite a bit of difference um, when comparing men and women. For men, there's usually not much happening, but for women, these amenities tend to get better once they have children. Okay, so if you have a lower number, you're going to have uh, basically um, lower frequency of working these more inconvenient work hours. Um, so especially after birth, you can see there tends to be wider of a gap. Is the question whether the job offers it in particular, whether you take up that? Like, if you look at working on Sunday, mm -hmm. is that saying whether women are saying they are not doing it or? They're just asking right now, do you, how often do you work on Sundays? Okay. 
So it's reporting like right now, what is your, what are, what are kind of your hours? But another way I thought like one could do is given a sorting into job groups. So in amenities, you look at the amenities of their peers, not them, right? Which is mm -hmm. but this is yeah. picking up yeah. goals. They're exactly. No. Well as well as the provision of the amenities. Yes, I agree. Yes, yes. So what we end up doing is not using those rough, uh, raw measures, but we actually aggregate them at the firm level. Yeah. So we um, we group that you know we create a firm fixed effect among everybody that replies. Yeah, and you can still see a similar pattern. Um, there. Is this across like all types of industries, like professional and labor, or is there kind of one or the other? Um, so, yeah, we didn't document yet sort of how these amendment measures correlate with all these different um, industries or occupations. We could we could do that a bit more. Um, so I don't have a really good sense, but yeah. Um, but even I think if you, even if you control for industry and um, or fixed effects, you still see this going on for sure. So another question: When you look at evening and bring it around, what is Work. Do you net this out of the shift workers? Uh, no. Uh, so, so yeah. Actually, this is just the raw data. So we're really not doing anything with it. Uh, yeah. So but, for all yeah. the graphs, it would be nice to see the non-shift workers. Okay. Who yeah. Work at night. Work at day. Work on Sundays. Right. So okay. Work <laughs> okay. And if it, this disappears with the shift workers, but. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That seems like a that makes sense. Do you have a sense of the ages of men and women relative to when they have kids? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it's something like a year or two difference, maybe. Yeah. So men tend to be just a little older. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. So we have. You know, these are kind of the measures that we have. Um, we think they do. T they do seem to be capturing something that is. You know, has to do with having children. Um, so. We basically now create a uh, composite amenity measure from these different ones, simply using this um, principal component analysis. Okay, so I think that's going to pick up a bit. You know, if a lot of these measures are capturing the same thing, we don't want to be uh, counting them many times, right? So uh, it's just drawing out the variation combined from these different measures. Um, and so now we also flip the sign um, such that a higher number is better amenity, and we can see a similar pattern where men's amenities tend to not change, if at all decrease, and then for women, there's really a big increase. So this is what we're going to use for our estimation. Okay, so uh, now just jump into the model. So this is the life cycle model, as I was explaining earlier. Um, and we have women age 20 to 60. Every year they have to make these three discrete choices. Uh, how many hours do you want to work? This can be not working, part time, full time. Uh, there's going to be a job search decision, and then if they get an offer, they can choose whether they want to accept or not. And here, what is a job? It's going to be a weight and amenity bundle, um, and we have a finite number of these types. Okay. And here, actually, we're keeping things super simple right now, um, also to have it a bit more tractable. Um, and we only have four different job types, so we just have sort of above and median uh, wage or above and median amenity. And then right now we have two education groups, um, endogenous human capital accumulation and exogenous marriage, divorce, and fertility. Okay, so how does job search work? So we model it at a random draw from this underlying job distribution. And um, there's kind of, uh, you know, an, un an unconditional distribution, um, but we do adjust it, you know, depending on your current job type. So we see a lot of persistence in the way people make these transitions. If you are in a certain job type, it's much more likely that you're going to transition into the same job type again. Um, so to capture this, um, we are going to put some additional probability on the current job type that you have. Okay? So this is basically, you can um, understand that as people may be having more contacts in their own field, right? so it's easier for them to transition to a similar job. Um, and if you're unemployed, you simply search with the unconditional job distribution. Yes. No, I think it's it would be really interesting to think about that. So we're kind of deciding right now if we think it should be we should do it or not. Yeah. Um, yeah. So is there any way to control the fact that people can't just go into another job? 
right? They, there's qualifications, there's you know, mm -hmm. So is this over any job thing? This is, um, yeah, so the way we think about jobs here is actually at the firm level. So we observe basically firm to firm positions. Mm -hmm. Every job is of a different firm. Um, and we don't have really, um, we don't model too much, you know, your qualifications, except for the fact that we have these two education groups. Um, so that at least picks up some large differences between different people. Um, but yeah, we do not have more closely sort of what field they should study and things like that. If the job to job transition probabilities are basically fixed, what's the role, and wage is one of the job characteristics, what's the role of human capital? Matt? Yes, so you'll see in a second. Okay. I'll get to that in a second. Yeah. Okay, um, so yeah, so you basically uh, you're drawing from this distribution and what is job search doing? Um, so even if you're not actively uh, searching, we allow for you to have some positive probability of drawing uh, from this distribution, but if you're searching, you might have a higher probability. Okay, so it's just uh, increasing the likelihood that you can decide to switch. So you can always stay at your current job that you have if you're working positive um, hours. But whenever you do, you work zero hours, um, you lose your job and you have to find another one first before you can work again, unless you're enjoying uh, paternity or uh, sorry, parental uh, leave protection. Okay, so now we're coming to wages and human capital. Um, so for the wage, we have it being a function of both the, uh, the human capital or the work experience and this omega, which is the wage job type. So it's the uh, wage component of your job. Um, and this function is also education specific. And so, um, yeah, so we have, you know, in this case, general human capital, so you do, you can carry it around. Um, but, you know, there might be some differences in how you accumulate this human capital depending on the job type that you're in. Um, so we allow this to be adjusted by this A to J parameter. Um, and then also if you work part-time, um, this again depends on the age of day and also perhaps on um, what education group you're in. So maybe um, being highly educated, working part-time is going to be sort of more detrimental to your human capital than if you're uh, less educated. Going back to Sarah's earlier, I, I wonder if you could try to uh, deal with this idea of qualifications by experience be like industry specific or something. So you have your education, but then you also have to spend time with Space yeah. in order to get access to those types of jobs, mm -hmm. which would you know, be manifested with the company. Uh, yeah, so. yeah, we certainly could have high sort of um, yeah multi-dimensional uh, experience. Yeah. Just gets really tricky to yeah. estimate those models. Um, but I do agree that um, you know that is a concern. So we we do actually so we're estimating um, we're working on the estimation separately by education now. So we do think that we can capture at least some, as I said, bigger differences. Um, not every college person can do, or not every person that doesn't have a college degree can you know, go to a tech firm or something like that, right? So that should be captured there. Um, but yeah, if we want to model this in more detail, it can get very, um, very complicated. Okay, so um, for your labor income, it's just gonna be hours times wage. And for the hours when you work full-time, this is one. Um, and if you're working part-time, it's um, 0.6, which is roughly in the Netherlands how many hours you would be working. And then for, um, for women who are married, they might receive this income from their husband, which is just modeled as the woman's characteristics, so a function of her age and education. And uh, right now, uh, yeah, marriage, divorce, and fertility are exogenous. So we estimate these rates um, by education and age, you know, fertility is going to be conditioning on you being married or not, and divorce is going to be a function also of whether you have children or not. Okay, and then um, for period utility, we have a component that depends on consumption, then this part that depends on your uh, disutility from working. Um, so here, this is going to depend on if you have children and how old your kids are. And also here is where the amenities come in. So we think of amenities as making working kind of easier for women, um, and this can be the case especially when you have children. And then of course it also depends on your hours. If you work more hours, you might have more work disability. And then there's also this part which is capturing the search and switching costs. Um, and that's going to depend on also your child's age, your, um, and the fact that whether you're searching or not. And um, we allow for actually one period of pregnancy. So you're going to have a positive, a very high fertility shock, and you're going to be pregnant for one um, year and then have your kid. 
So, yeah, and then there's a discrete choice, so we add a six true value type one there. Okay. Uh, yeah. Was there a budget constraint? Oh, sorry, that just oh. consumption. I was like wondering where it's going. It's just going to be the sum of these two. Okay. Yeah. Oh. I think that is where. Probably it's in the more. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, right, so I was already explaining that earlier. So, what we actually end up doing is aggregating those amenity measures at the firm level in order to you know, have a more maybe general measure that's not too confounded by this person-specific um, family uh, circumstances. So because we have these two large surveys that actually, um, they're harmonized, so they actually ask the exact same question, we can just pull these, and we have firm identifiers, so we can construct these measures at the firm level. Um, so in terms um, of the wages, actually we have perfect coverage, right? So we have the admin data for the whole population, we can just run APM regression and then take the uh, firm, firm component of that. But for amenities, because this is a cross-section, we have only very few observations, for, um, multiple observations for the same individual. So we just run um, a normal fixed effect regression at the firm level and take those fixed effects. And so still, uh, you know, even though this is a survey, because we have a lot of observations, we can actually kind of construct these um, wage and amenity types for 85% of the sample. So we do cover the vast majority of the job spells. Um, and if we use, you know, if we look at these um, effects, these six effects that we're using, um, the wage residuals, um, you know, explains a lot of, of what's going on for the residual explanation, of the residual variation if you take out age and education. And then if we, if we look at the fixed effect for amenity, it explains something like 20% of the variation. So they are still quite um, informative about the amenities. And you go to the new slide and just to find the So amenities really affect the distributed income model. That's yes. Mm -hmm. And then I understand that when we look on the data to bring that from specific human capital there, there and it's like specific. Mm -hmm. Is this some other way to bring in amenities from other market? So amenities also affect the evolution of human capital through the job type. So this is one other place where it matters. Yeah. So you might, yeah, so if you're worried that some jobs might um, right. give you a steeper career or something, yeah. Um, is there something else you have in mind? No, that, that helps. Okay. Is there an assumption the way you estimate amenities that for people who never get an offer from the industry or for J, that the people who do get it provide a good counterfactual for the amenity they would get? Uh, sorry, say that again. Yeah, sorry. So uh, there are, there's, let's say, two industries, and uh, a person never gets a, an offer from the first industry, mm -hmm. but you're assuming kind of that the amenities of the people who do get an offer from that industry provide a good counterfactual for the people who never uh, get an offer from that industry. I guess I'm just curious, um, like, so mm -hmm. some, some industries must be heavily male dominated, not be heavily female dominated. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm just wondering if. Um, I, I guess it depends on the kind of factuals you're doing, but whether women are uh, going to be entering one particular industry and if the uh, amenity provision in that industry will be changing because women are entering. Oh, okay. Uh, no, so the whole distribution of job types is completely unchanged in the counterfactual. Okay. So this is this is a partial curve model. Okay. So we're not, yeah, we're not letting those things adjust. Um, yeah, but so the, the way the amenities work now is that they do actually mean something because the way we categorize is just simply based on above and below the mean right now. I see. Um, so yeah, so all the all the jobs in that one specific group they do have similar amenities as reported by those people. Oh, yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, so as I mentioned we just have these four types right now um, that make it a bit easier to display as well. Um, so we have um, now the different job types by the age of the woman. And um, dark blue is the sort of best type of job where they have both high amenity and high wages, and um, low, low amenity and low wages uh, red. Okay? So as you can see from here, um, really the majority of people start out in the worst type of jobs when they're young. Um, and then there's really this climbing the ladder process where they end up getting to uh, eventually the best type of jobs. So this is, this is a story for most of the people. Um, so this is kind of interesting because you know, it kind of suggests that perhaps 
there's not a lot of trading off, at least along these dimensions, um, when it comes to Asian amenity. So it's possible to get the best of both worlds and to kind of improve your conditions in both dimensions. So the low is you the model, and yeah. you get the confidence Yeah. And these are below medium Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is this is not taking into account human capital yeah, yeah, yeah. or anything. It's just solely the AKM um, firm fixed effect. And for the amenity, uh, what what do you put into the PCA? The PCA is using those six measures that I have showed you at the beginning. Um, yeah, and then. Um, when aggregating, it's only using the firm fixed effect regression. Okay, so the way to interpret amenities in this model is um, like from the supply side behavior. Yeah, it's just sort of aggregating over these different things. The flexibility. That are supposed to, it's kind of not exactly flexibility, but more inconvenient work hours that we think are harder to you know, make work-life balance work with children. Um, right, and so for the estimation, uh, we estimate by method of simulated moments. Uh, we do have these exogenous um, transition rates for fertility and marriage. Um, and then in the model, we have um, right now something like 113 moments. Um, and we have both, of course, stocks of these different employment rates by the women's characteristics, how many kids they have, what jobs they work. And then we have the uh, dynamic moments. Which <laughs> Uh, which type of jobs do different people switch to, depending on, again, their characteristics and their family status. And then we also have, you know, how much is the wage increase um, by how much you're working and what's your current job type. Those things allow us to identify, um, let's say, the A to J is coming from, how much is your wage growth, depending on what type of wage you're currently working. And so we have something like 44 parameters in the current version. I've sort of lost track of, uh, of something. If a woman uh, or a man uh, drops out of the labor force, do they continue in this in in the sample, or are they are they sensitive? They do, yeah. So yeah, so this is actually only a model for, for women right now. So we are only okay. going to estimate okay. it for women. Um, but yeah, we have everybody in there, um, even if they're not working. They're in, they're in there, so they're just labeled as unemployed. So we don't distinguish between unemployment or non-employment, but they're sort of there being but, unemployed. But and they have to search. But you're going to get a parameter for searching from from an unemployed versus searching for employment. Right. Yeah. So actually, right now we only have one for both unemployed and employed search, but we are also working on a version where we have uh, more parameters that distinguish between whether you're employed or not for the job search costs. Okay. So. So crucially, yeah. So we're estimating these search costs, right? Which are going to allow us to. Um, understand how much do uh, mothers get penalized in terms of um, the job search aspect. Okay, so some quick um, graphs for the fit. So this is the same graph you saw before. Now the model is for the dotted lines. And so these different stocks of the job types by age, we can fit reasonably well. And then we have job to job transitions, um, so type to type. And here, as you, uh, as you see, we have a lot of um, persistence, as I was trying to explain before. So, um, you know, in these, diag in these diagonal ones, um, we have a lot more mass. And generally, you can also see that if you're um, in, the in the worst type of jobs, you know, you transition a lot into these better jobs. Um, but if you're in the highest category, um, it's less likely for you to transition down, which makes sense. And then the model does reasonably well um, in sort of the simple random search um, Way of modeling. Um, and so, yeah, so this is somewhere uh, on the job switching, depending on your uh, motherhood status. So, we also have more switching going on for childless women. Um, and again, the switching is less if you're in the best type of jobs. So, the model also can capture these broad patterns. And then um, for hours around having your first kid in the Netherlands, even before people have kids, and the women are very likely to work part-time. Um, so we have very high part-time rate, but that really shoots up, and then um, almost nobody works full-time once they have kids. Great, um, and so just to highlight some other key estimates. Um, so, you know, high-amenity jobs are actually valuable because they decrease 
the work through fertility by nine uh, percent. Um, and then for high wage jobs, they have um, an even larger benefit in some sense because um, they increase your wages by twenty percent. Um, and then for um, on the job search, the baseline job finding rate is twenty six percent for a given year. But um, if you're actively searching, you have a probability of 80%. So it's very effective to do on the job search. And then uh, when looking at these search costs for the women, there are some search costs on the baseline. But it's um, quite a bit higher for pregnant women or mothers of kids of any age. So women are much less likely to do job search when they have children. Um, and then first bullet point to that on average, that's the average. They still value it, yeah. So currently, what, how we model it is um, as a scaling parameter for your entire work utility. Um, so even uh, for women with no kids, they have some small positive work utility that's going to get lowered a little bit by the amenity, by high amenity jobs. Um, but then, really, it kicks in when you have kids and your men, your disability gets much larger, and then the proportional decrease is much more meaningful. So, in the model or the, in the estimation, the woman who works at a gets an offer from a high amenity firm still has the option of working part time at her decision. Yes. So, right now, our, uh, our decision is decoupled from the job search or your job type. So in any work, in any job, you can always choose to work full time, part time, or uh, to give up that job, and that's we think it's reasonably realistic in the setting of the Netherlands because there's just a ton of protection for part time work and a lot of rights given to workers to be able to scale down the hours and uh, freely choose how many hours they want to work. So um, in this context, I think it's, it's more or less reasonable. <laughs> so it's, whereas I think in the U.S. you would think that the ability to choose your hours is very much an amenity. Um, but in the Netherlands, it's sort of something that's actually guaranteed to most people. Uh, sorry, Yeah, so um, so that's per month, the, the amount. So I should think of like uh, pregnancy increases the search costs by about a thousand euros a month or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Do you have, is there a, did you compute standard deviation of amenity relative to uh, like salary per month? Like how, how are amenities valued uh, relative? Um, you mean the value of amenities? Yeah. Uh, so we, yeah. So we only have this one number since we only have these two amenity groups right okay. now. Um, so we didn't sort of. I see. But I guess you could try to maybe, yeah. Um, Is there any specification? How do hours track? So, uh, yes. So hours uh, scale it down, I believe. Okay. So there's. Yeah. It's, it's not proportional. <clears throat> so we estimate another parameter for a separate parameter for part time versus full time, okay. and it's actually disproportionately more useful to work part time. Um, so that's I think that's how you rationalize that there's so much part time work in the Netherlands. Um, but I think it makes sense because because somehow just having if, if somewhat fewer hours is going to help you a lot, especially when you have children. That does not be is it parameter, in this case, parameter for working full time? No, so it, it's all, everything's interacted with amenities. Okay. So there's kind of the stock of disutility, which depends on the uh, number of kids, the age of the youngest kid, um, and your hours. And then that everything's being multiplied by the scalar, depending on which amenity you have. Um, just that baseline cost number, is that for women only or like so the model is only being estimated for women, so everything here is for women. Yeah, yeah, we are making some adjustments to this, but we're uh, putting some we're uh, putting a parameter in by age as well, so we're gonna have more detail there. But, yeah. Okay, and then so lastly, we estimate this unconditional job offer distribution, and um, we can see that you know both of the jobs are kind of the worst type. Um, but there is a decent amount of jobs in each of those job type groups. Um, so it's definitely not the case that you have um, most of the jobs in the up diagonal, which would uh, speak more to a compensating wage differential story, right? If there was a big trade off between firms of offering high amenity or wages, they would, we would see uh, the most jobs would be either high amenity, low wage, or low amenity, high wage. But we see some jobs in all these categories. So it's kind of a mixed story in some sense.
Okay, so now coming to the simulations that we're doing. So the first part is, uh, you know, maybe a key result that we have. How much um, do these extra search costs for women um, that are pregnant or with kids actually contribute to the child penalty? Uh, so as I was saying, there is this kind of more uh, well-known channel of, of um, work to utility, uh, but now we're also considering the search part. So in this counterfactual, we're just eliminating the extra search costs that women face when they're pregnant or having small children. We leave in the baseline search cost. Okay, so when we do um, when we do this counterfactual, we can see that lifetime earnings increase by quite a bit, so by 10%. Um, and of course, this is mostly coming from the fact that women are women are searching a lot more, especially mothers, and then mothers are switching jobs more. And this results in uh, more women working in the best type of jobs, and they're mostly coming from the lowest type of jobs. So they're able to kind of climb up the ladder more. And then, of course, this has compounding effects, right? Because once you're in the best type of jobs, there's also persistence, right? You're less likely to drop down again. And also, if you have higher wages, better amenities, you're going to work more hours, accumulate more human capital. So all these things will uh, matter a lot over the life cycle. So if we try to look at this decomposition, um, so the blue line here is the baseline, and then the red line is getting rid of any form of child penalty by getting rid of both the work utility due to children and also the extra search costs. And the orange line is just the search cost um, counterfactual. So um, we can see that, yeah, so this gap already starts merging at earlier ages, and um, basically the 10% is coming from discounting everything here, right? Um, and then if you got rid of the extra disability search costs, you would bump, um, bump this up by another two-thirds. So um, the search costs account to something like one-third of the overall child penalty right now, according to the estimation. Can you just explain why your model replicates the finding that like people reduce search before birth because they're pregnant? Yeah. So it's coming from mostly two factors. One is the pregnancy period. So there you know for sure you're going to have a kid next period. So you're going to be searching less. Do you observe pregnancy in the data, or I guess you observe ex post? Because yeah, we don't observe. Um, yeah, we don't observe miscarriage. I mean, potentially we could, but we don't have the data now. Okay. Yeah. So we don't. Yeah. So uh, only for realize. So pregnancy is a natural input into the fixed uh, into the search costs. Yes. Okay. So that's how we get that parameter right. here. For big things. And then also there's the marriage process. So if you get married, you're more likely to have a kid. So then when they get married, they already start searching us or, or more, or whatever situation they're in. Yeah. Um, OK, so uh, yeah, so basically the bottom line here is that um, the search ca channel can be very important. The ability to climb up the ladder is going to have a large impact on your um, lifetime earnings. And then here, uh, we're just trying to understand, is it important to um, take that into account, this search process? when considering other policies. Um, so we're modeling this typical policy of uh, you know, subsidizing child care. Um, here we're um, just imposing a 200 euro subsidy per month. So it's quite moderate. Um, and so what we find is, so we first simulate um, for, you know, for a version where we fix the current search and switching behavior. So we don't allow women to adjust um, which types of jobs they have. And we, of course, we still see an increase in lifetime earnings because women are um, incentivized to work more. But then when we allow women to also be adjusting on this uh, yeah, job search and switching, we see a larger effect um, by roughly 20%. Because now women know that in the future they can work more with this child care subsidy. And they are also incentivized to um, search more to get to a better job. So these um, kind of interact with each other and amplifies the effect of the child care policy. Yeah, the child care subsidy. Sorry, I missed how child care enters in your basement. Oh, yeah, sorry. So right now, it's actually, uh, we actually don't have it. Uh, we, don't, we don't really have it. Oh. But it's just simply an employment subsidy. So it's saying if you're employed, you get these 200 euros extra. That's how we model it. If you have a kid, yes, exactly. Yeah. I, I per kid, 200 euro per kid, I think. Yeah. At the same time, so when you're going through the last graph, the, the breakouts by different um, yeah, like it, it, people are facing constraints on either being able to afford child care or not being able to contract sufficient child care. Would that show up as a work disutility or a search cost in your model? 
Uh, work disability. Okay. Because it would prevent them from working more hours. Yeah. So yeah. So we so the childcare is modeled as only for up to six year olds. Yeah. So it would be this this area, I guess. Yeah. I guess like using the language of work disability, I <laughs> think could be um, used uh, make implications that I'm not necessarily sure. It's like what you want the model to say. Is mm -hmm. people could take this and say, oh, like when people have kids, they don't want to work anymore. And mm -hmm. the childcare store isn't about not wanting, they just can't necessarily afford right. to work in Yes, so I think we should put, so in the baseline estimation, we should model childcare more, more in detail, which we haven't done. Um, so then that's going to affect our estimate of the work as utility. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so if, if in, it's in there, then yeah, then I can see. In the Netherlands, yeah, the childcare costs are very low, anyways. But there's something like maybe 300 euros a month. So, and everybody pretty much has childcare. I mean, available to them if they want it. Um, and then, yeah, we should probably just have that in there, and then um, just increase that cost by 200 euros. The way you model the childcare subsidy is it different than a wage subsidy to mothers, to working mothers? Um. Is it just it's, more added? Yeah, it's very similar. It's very similar for mothers with kids in that age range, but it's going to get multiplied by the number of kids that you have. So and it's not multiplied by the number of hours. It is. Yeah, it is proportional to your hours. Okay. So I'm wondering, like embedded in this, is there an elasticity of labor supply for mothers? Yes. And exactly. Is yeah. it one that will make us happy when we see? Right, good point. <laughs> yes, I don't think we calculated that right now, but we should present that. Um, but yeah, you're right in the fact that, you know, in the sense that this is mostly speaking to the fact that any subsidy that would encourage mother's labor supply, you know, would probably produce these similar results where if you endogenize the search and switching, would have a larger impact than if you didn't endogenize that. Yeah. Just an unsolicited advice. Um, I think that the counterfactuals that you're showing us and the policy experiments that you're showing us are basically implemented by changing the parameters of the model. Mm -hmm. So I think that the most promising experiment that you can show us is about this parental leave policy because it would be really interesting to show that the previous uh, policy that kind of put restrictions in the, in the tenure to get access to parental leave actually induces mothers more than for mothers to be, more than fathers to be, to reduce their search effort. Mm -hmm. And that's really interesting. That's really policy relevant. It's something yeah. that you can work out through the mechanisms of the model instead of directly affecting the, the parameters. That's mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, so right. So this one is sort of just changing the child care parameter. But yeah, I mean, I, I agree, I guess this. This one is kind of more of a theoretical, it's a quantification exercise. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so uh, let me just show you the results for um, the last counterfactual. Um, yeah, so here, this one, I guess, turned out a bit different than we expected. <laughs> but so just to explain again what happened. So um, prior to 2015, there was, um, there was a rule that you could only take unpaid parental leave, which basically just means job protection when you decide not to work. Um, so you could only get that if you work at the same employer for at least a year. So basically we model this to be, you have to be at the same job for at least a year. Um, and then afterwards you could take it even if you just uh, switch jobs. And so what is the immediate effect? So there's going to be more jobs switching prior to the, you know, exactly the year before giving birth, right? Because now you're not concerned about losing those benefits anymore. Um, so this is also what we see, so that makes sense. Um, so we have more switching for these pregnant women. Okay, the effect is still pretty, pretty small though. Um, and then, however, because of the parental leave policy, there's also a lot of other stuff going on, right? Um, so now there's going to be women that can switch jobs um, and immediately uh, be eligible, right, to take time off, and that's what they do. So when we see a decrease of employment for these uh, mothers with a newborn, so that is going to have a negative impact on the lifetime income. And then um, in the year after, there's a, a, a positive effect because there's women now being um, affected by the job protection and they can return to the pre-birth employer without having to go through the job search process. Okay, so that also is going to have some positive impact. But then if we just net everything out, 
we don't see much, we don't see too much on the lifetime earnings, so it's like a 0.2 decrease because we have this effect dominating over the other effects. Okay. And we don't see too much difference either in the composition of the jobs that they have. We would have, you know, if this effect was very big, you would have hoped to see that they actually end up working in better jobs, but right now it's not really what we're getting. Same question. Do you estimate your model data pre 2015? Um, so actually right now we estimated with the whole sample, assuming the um, old policy, but we have to uh, estimate it separately for the two different time stamps. Yeah. Do you have a sense of how much people value earnings uh, relative to the other things that enter the utility function, like the switching costs and the, uh, and the disutility board? Because maybe this is actually quite well for enhancing, even if there aren't so much. Yes, um, I think I had a crap on this, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so here we kind of have a comparison of how this affects um, earnings and utility around the timing of first birth. So you can see that there's this large drop in earnings because this is just by a patient group um, and then compared to the baseline. So there's really this huge decrease in earnings because they now can take um, friends leave. Um, and then for utility, they really gain a lot because they like taking parental leave. And uh, this, this effect kind of um, persists throughout. So yeah, so we do have large, perhaps large increases in utility. Um, but this is now in percentage points, so we have to convert this into consumption equivalent terms. Yeah, so this is not to say that this policy was not a good policy. It's just if you wanted to think in terms of, you know, being able to switch more, having benefits, um, and on lifetime of earnings, this is not something we see right now. Uh, but yeah, it's still maybe useful. And we hope to get some reduced form results on this and to use that to cross our model, which we haven't done yet. And you might see bigger effects when you estimate the baseline before 2015, because yeah. many of the behaviors that you're picking up to be down parameters right. are due to the, to the new yeah, now it's convoluted. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, or I mean, you know, we, we probably will try to dig a bit more. Maybe there are certain groups that are affected more than others, and things like that. Yeah. Yes. So this is parental leave. So um, if you had a, a male uh, parent and a female parent, or two female parents, they could decide about when and whether to take leave. Um, have you done any dyadic work right now in terms of how people are thinking about this as partners? And then my my like really little question is. Um, what fraction of partners are actually married versus just long-term cohabiting in the Netherlands? Is it mm. more common there? Yeah, it's it's very common to cohabit. There's actually two different forms of cohabiting. There's sort of a uh, license you can get for being registered partners. That's also a large fraction. And then we also have just cohabiting partners. Um, yeah. You count that as marriage? We count everybody as married right now. Okay. Yeah. I'm thinking maybe a little similar license. Sarah. Have you have you thought? Are you able and and with the data and have you thought about actually figuring in the characteristics of the husband's uh, job? I mean, do yeah. men who are in high high amenity jobs make it easier for their wives to switch? Right. That's yeah. This is a good point. Um, so Minji's job market paper was on that, <laughs> where she looks at um, the combination of the type of jobs that the husband has. Uh, we haven't we haven't done it, um, but it's true that yeah that would be a good thing to well, what did she find? To check. She found that so she looked at flexible and non flexible occupations, and she found that husbands that have more flexible uh, work in more flexible occupations that decreases the women's child penalty. So she kind of found this cross effect. Um, I think we looked um, we looked for a couple of the amenities. Um, I think we looked for uh, yeah, and, and we didn't see anything, but. We should just check again. Okay. Great. Um, yeah. So this is uh, what we have so far. So just to recap. Um, so we show these uh, data patterns for women's job search, job switching, and also child-friendly amenities around the timing of first birth. And we see that um, women basically search less and switch less when they have kids. And at the same time, their amenities actually increase. Um, so the amenities, you know, are important to them, but maybe they're not able to get to them because they they have these high search costs. Um, then we um, sort of embed this in this life cycle framework where we have choices on job search and also hours. 
and we get the result that search is in fact more costly for women and mothers. Um, if we do the decomposition, it can attribute uh, uh, roughly a third of the child density can be attributed to um, the search channel. So this is something like a 10% decrease in lifetime earnings. Um, then, you know, considering actually the search and switching channel can be important uh, when evaluating other policies that can affect maternal labor supply. And then lastly, this reform that actually happened in the Netherlands um, had some beneficial impact in terms of job switching of pregnant women, but it also encouraged women to kind of work less when they had ch uh, children. So uh, overall, there's a small decrease in the lifetime earnings. Thanks. Uh, yeah. So we had a question from the chat on Zoom. Thank you, everybody on Zoom. Uh, one question: I'm curious about the situation with second children and beyond. Have you estimated how having a second child or more would impact your model? Uh, yes. So um, our fertility process, you know, we do have sort of the, the possibility that women have a second child, and that would also impact uh, impact their fertility uh, of work. We do not have a separate parameter right now for the search cost that depends on, that increases with the number of kids. That's something we're adding. But yeah, in principle, if you have another kid, it's going to make it even harder for you to work and also to search, uh, to search and switch shops. Well, if there are no more obvious questions, we have a couple of minutes. If you wanted to say hi to Hannah, thank you so much for coming. And then at one o'clock, the training meeting will begin in this room. So thanks, everybody.